Well, it's Gotti. How y'all doing, man? So, this video here I'm about to do, man. I'm basically going to talk about Supreme Team documentary. I talked about it in my first video, but I didn't get to talk about it in this one. Shout out to Nas. Great documentary. Great message. Um, I think all the youth need to watch this this documentary because basically it's it's really about you know dudes coming from South Jamaica Queens rose to the heights of being the biggest narcotics trafficking organization in Southeast Queens, right? The humble beginnings, right? Both dudes didn't grow up in the projects, you know, came from good family homes, right? But, you know, struggle, poverty around them, um, basically seeing your family struggle, you know, working a, a nine to five, trying to put food on the plate, you know, basically um, seeing police brutality and racism and all type of stuff like that, it caused somebody to get into criminal life. But it's a great documentary. I watched all three episodes. Um, It was dope. You know what I'm saying? It had the, the original team members in there. You know what I'm saying? You know, you had Prem, um, God's son in there, Mook Diamonds. You had um, Bing, who was in there. You had... um. Who else was in there? You had Bing. You had Green Eye Born. Um, the boy Shannon. Quite a few, quite a few pre-team dudes was in there. Quite a few pre-team homies was in there. Um, Nas did his thing. LL Cool J, Irv, Shanti, um, Derek Parker was in there, Sterling Jackson, Eric Adams. Um it was a, it was a big it was a big thing and and the thing about it um watching the documentary right and i always say like the preteen was like the 80s and 90s version of what the council was in the 70s you know what i'm saying it was well organized structure like the italian mafia you know coming from like cuz preen started you know being under the ronnie bumps and uh, pop freemans um, seven crown, you know, we, you know, I love how they talked about the seven crowns because the Fatados, you know, um, Cat, oh man, a whole bunch of them, you know, Bernard Wright, you know, um, Tom Brown that did Jamaica Funk. It's a whole lot of people that was seven crown, you know, Eric Adams, who was seven crowns. So it talks about how everything started from the seven crowns. You know, the race riot with the whole, if you don't know about the Clifford Glover case, he was the young boy that got murdered by the NYPD in 1973. Um, Very important story. Very important story. They don't talk about that story. You know what I'm saying? Because they always talk about, you know, Eleanor Bumpers and Michael Stewart. But his case was a very important case. In 1973, he was murdered by the NYPD in 1973. And the cop was acquitted after he murdered him. So... With that being said, it talks about, you know, you know, pr Prince and Preems, you know, basically their childhood and how they started in the ranks in the streets, you know, from Seven Crown to to the drug game, you know. And they talk about the organization and they also talked about, you know, how they got busted, you know, and how they moved low profile because they was a low profile organization. You know what I'm saying? If you really look at Prem. Out of everybody, right? Corley Wall, which I would say is one of the most incognito dudes ever in Southeast Queens. 
incognito, low pro, get your money. A lot of dudes will say he's like the black chin galante, right? Which he, he moves kind of like the chin. Um, And you got the Fatados. They did their thing too. The Fatados, you know, tall, uh, you know, and, 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 and Tony and, 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 and Lance and the whole Fatado brothers and you know, and then you got Cat, you know, and the thing, this is the thing about Fat Cat, right? And Pappy Mason. Um, if you know the story, right? Fat Cat was a shrewd businessman, but Fat Cat, and like how the story, how they talked about it in part two, is that when you have a disorganized organization, Things like murdering police causes dissension. With Fat Cat having a loose cannon around him, until his day, Sammy the Bull even talked about it, till his day, you know, Cat is still angry about that, in which he should be. You know, somebody mess up your organization, they murder police officers, right? Orders a hit on not only your, just your parole officer, but, your po but the police officer, right? You get... Remanded on a violation. You could come back home. You just sitting there on a violation. He comes, the dude orders hits that he never told him to order. And because he did that, that's what messed up his organization. And like Prince says so eloquently, when you got organized crime and you got disorganized crime, those type of events happen. And what happened was Pappy was not a businessman, he was an idiot. One of the most stupidest, I would say, dudes to ever be in an organization. He was stupid. He was a stupid dude. You know what I'm saying? And he was what you call a liability. Because him being a liability, not only that he was stealing from Cat and all type of stuff that he was doing behind the scenes, he was just doing a whole lot of BS. And this is what caused Cat to do what he did. That's why I always say Fat Cat, his own circle, was a part of his demise. And that's why, you know, Cat, his organization crumbled away, crumbled. And even, you know, shout out to Glaze. Glaze always talks about it on his um on his show. About the stupidity that Patty Mason did. And, you know, what happened was it caused a lot of friction and problems with people that have nothing to do with that situation with Edward Byrne. Tommy Mickens. It like it put like a a target on these dudes back. Like Tommy Mickens, you know, Corley, you know. Um not so much Corley, but the Fatados, the 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 the, the Preems, you know, Cat. It put targets on their backs because it made them seem like, you know, because they had an affiliation, they were associated with this dude that, you know, everything was what it was. And that's what caused the downfall of the drug trade in Southeast Queens. And I think that's what caused the downfall of the drug game throughout that era because... When the 90s came in, they turned it up. And that's what killed the drug game. They turned it up. TNT, all of that. And it, and it shows you how one incident caused a whole nation to go crazy on narcotics dealers. Before then, drugs was flowing smoothly. Nobody was getting, nobody was getting crazy numbers. Um, no type of crazy task force was kicking in doors like how they started. Like they was giving them draconian numbers because of this, and not only giving them draconian numbers, but it changed the way of policing. You know, it became tactical, and that's all because of Edward Burns murder, which like. Prince and Preem said, and they said this before. It's not the first time they said this, but they said this before previously on if you ever seen American Gangster. 
that this thing had nothing to do with the Supreme Team. It was fat. Kid, it was Pappy Mason and the Bebo crew that did this. It wasn't even Fat Cat didn't even order that. They did that, you know, you know, basically on some like prove my loyalty, just stupid shit, and which it caused a man that he couldn't get his freedom because of a stupid fool that caused the downfall of his organization. And to this day, that fat cat still feel some type of way about Pappy Mason, which he has every right to feel. You know? But back to the documentary. So, it was a good documentary. Now, here's my opinion on the documentary. It was good. I feel like the messaging was good. It, it, it also talked about, you know, how Prem, you know, the last bid when he got arrested in um 2002, you know, December 2002 when he got arrested. Talked about how, like, he went to go see Prince in Houston, and then they got him in Miami. He was in Miami, and they arrested him right there in Miami. And he was in, you know, he was in the room with a shorty, you know, and shorty was acting crazy. But you know, like the cop said in the end of the, the end of the joint, he said, "Prem is what you call a gentleman's gangster." <laughs> And I always believe that Prem is what you call the last of a gentleman's gangster. Because a gentleman's gangster is like the Nicky Bonses. You know, the Freddie Myers. You know, the Prems. You know, they don't make those type of gangsters. Gentlemen's gangsters. Charismatic gangsters. You know, he was one of those guys that was charismatic, smart, intelligent, move with logic and not emotions and that's what it was about um and the if you really look at it the documentary is about them both fighting for their appeal because prince is fighting for an appeal to come home Prem is fighting for an appeal and just right now they just about to read he trying to get a read uh, a judge um okay him to get a reduced sentence so Prem is trying is fighting to come home so as just as Prince is fighting to come home. Prince been in there longer. Prince been in there 32 years. He's been in there since 1990. He's been incarcerated since March 31st, 1990. Prem been incarcerated um 19 years, going on 20 years. December will be 20 years since Prem's been incarcerated. He's been in there since December, I think 13th or the 20th, thir December 20th of, of 2002. So Prem and Prince has been incarcerated. You know, Prem been there a little less than Prince because Prince been in there longer since 90. He's been in there. And Prem has been incarcerated since 2002, December 2002. So it'll be 20 years. So I understand what they're doing. And when I hear a lot of people talking, right, say, oh, why they ain't got such and such in the documentary? Why Bimmy ain't in there? Uh, why they ain't talk about the, the Colombians? Why they ain't do this? Why they ain't talk about the, all the murders? Why they ain't talk about the Boldings? Why they ain't talk about uh, them murder, you know, the parole officer? Uh, you know, and and and, 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 and talk about the E-Money bag situation and, and Troy Singleton and all this. And, and all that. Listen, listen, man. Listen. These men are fighting an appeal, okay? What people need to understand is, right? Prem is fighting an appeal. Prince is fighting her appeal. Why would they put negative? That's like glorification of crimes. Why would you put glorifying stories in a documentary? The ones that know, know. The ones that don't know, don't need to know. This is a plat. This documentary was basically trying to provide a message for youth. Don't end up like us. Don't end up in here. I'd rather be free than be in prison. That's what pre that's what Prince message is. That's what pre message is. It's a message to the youth. Go straight. This is that's why I respect men like Prem and Prince. Those are real OGs trying to provide a message. But you see, in our community, we love to glorify. The stories, like Bing, 
he cried. If you watch his part when he started talking about his incarceration, and then he talked about how like we he was coming home, and basically he was like, "Yo, Preem, we don't gotta sell drugs no more. We we fully legit." And he was so hurt that he went got back incarcerated, and that he felt crushed that the future was dim for us. And that was a powerful, that was one of the powerful scenes in there when it's like when Irv said, yo, he said, I don't want to be a president for your label. When he talked about he wanted to give Prem like a big position in Murder, Inc. And Prem just felt like, nah, man, I'm going to be Prem whether I'm dead or in jail, I'ma still be praying. Being a corporate, like he just didn't see that. So when I hear people talk about, yo, what about the, the street shit? Like, come on, my nigga. Like, that's what people don't understand. This documentary wasn't about glorifying sh the streets. It wasn't about glorifying drug trafficking. That's why I like this documentary. It was not about the glorification of being a drug dealer. Or being a street dude. It was about the messaging of two black men that's been incarcerated. Just because they was trying to make it out. Trying to be successful enough so they don't have to sell drugs no more. You know? It's just... It's sad that us as a people... We only like to speak about the negative and not promote the positive message. And I think, like I said, I think people need to sit their kids down and let them watch this. Teachers that work in uh, programs with outreach uh, youth, dealing with youth. You know, I think they should show this documentary to young kids to like, listen, these men is... They had the flash. They had the cars, the girls, the women, all of that. But now they in an eight by ten cell. You know, Prince is at least I think Prince is like fifty eight, fifty nine years old. You know, he's fifty nine. I think Prince, yeah, Prince is probably I think he's like fifty nine years old, fifty eight or fifty nine years old. He gonna be sixty next year. Cream is. 61, 62 years old. Oh, he's going to be 62. He's 61 years old. Prem. Okay? 61, 62 years old. Prem is. These is much mature, older men. They not men in their 40s and 50s and 20s. Not, they in their... Prince is in his 50s. About to be in his 60s. But these is mature men. They're not in their 20s and 30s. These are mature, older men that's been incarcerated for a long period of their life. Preen was able to get out. But, you know, they always tell you, trouble always finds you. And... You know, a lot of times our ego get us in situations that we can't get ourselves out of. You know, Preen, um, you know, story is a, a very sad story. It's like the story of a wasted, a wasted talent because he really wanted to do a lot of positive things. You know, with him trying to do the movie, he's trying to get into the movie game. You know, him doing, you know, a lot of the, he wanted to do a lot of the Donald Goins joints and turn them into movies, you know. And I really do believe that if Preem didn't get caught up with that case, he probably would have been doing a lot of powerful things in the movie industry because he, that was his main focus, you know. But, you know, like they said, man, the streets, um, a lot of things just make you want to focus on one good thing.
but it can also take you under and make you focus on the negative thing. And that's what the messaging about in that documentary that really resonates. I hear the, the dudes that throw shade. It's just like, okay, perfect example. Shout out to Unique, Mecca Audio. Unique did a joint with Alpo. And the joint was trying to show the youth, like, stay out these streets. Stay on the right path. It was a message. It was all about messaging. Dudes was throwing shade. Oh, yo, this nigga, nah, nah, nah. And hating on what Unique was trying to do. See, with the preteen documentary, it's the same thing. It's it's about, because it, it tackles, if you really look at the documentary, it don't only talk about drug culture it talks about poverty talks about gentrification it talks about black um entrepreneurship and economics it talks about racism police brutality it talks about classism it talks about all of that in this documentary which i like that they touched on other things besides the glamour the glamification and the glorification of drug deal. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of these documentaries are all about glamour. Oh, yeah, yo. Yo, yo, son. Murder, da, 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 da. He, he laid this nigga down. He did this. Like, come on. We're not going to talk about the effects of the drugs. The effects of the community. You know what I'm saying? Like, I heard one nigga say, oh, they should have went to the projects where these niggas sold drugs that we want to know about where the body, we want to know about who was the hit team, we want to know about uh, the crackheads and, like, like my nigga, so you want to know about the pov, the pain. Just like when AZ did, you know, one day I respect about AZ, right? AZ was talking about game over, right? He was like, oh, we don't want to hand out from him. He, he ratted on, he, yeah, rat, right, hell. Like, it's like, us as a people, we don't want to hear brothers speaking positive and talking about we got to do better as a community. We got to stop the violence. We got to stop going in these prisons and making these people rich. You know what I'm saying? Like, it ain't nothing glamorous about what happened. Like, listen, Preen, even though he had a run and he was doing his thing in the game, that man wished he was had his freedom. Same with Prince. These brothers wish they had their freedom. Prince was on the phone um, at the um, the premiere when they was doing the um, premiere for the video. He was talking about how, like, he wished he was home to see his documentary. That he wished he was home to be there to talk to the people and talk to the youth and talk to the community. Just like with Larry Hoover right now, he's, he's basically trying to get his freedom, right? That man been in prison since 1973, you know? The man would have been released, but because he wanted gang members to start voting, they was like, okay, we're going to lock this man up. We're going to get this man 100 and something years. And that's the thing about us as a people. Anytime we want to push the narrative of consciousness and do positive things in our community, things happen. Like Tupac, right? I, I was kind of the only thing I didn't, um, the only thing I thought they should have touched more on and should have had in there was the Thug Life Manifesto because Preem was there when they, when they did it, his signatures on the manifesto. But here's the thing, what people don't talk about. What Tupac was trying to do was unite all of the hustlers in New York. And the hustlers in Cali, the hustlers in Chicago, the hustlers down south. But he most importantly wanted to unite all the hustlers in New York, you know, and bring them together so they could stop. So the violence of stopping the community. And just like that, he gets shot in Quad Studio. And then that, you know, all hell broke loose. But you see, it's always when people want to do positive. Other people want negative. And I hope this 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 documentary really um 
helps a young, out, at rich, um, at risk youth that wants to join a gang, that wants to join the streets, and they watch that documentary and it, it could spark something in they they brain to change, and to deal with education. You know, this documentary also talks about education, man. It also talks about a lot of things. It talks about you know Eric Adams, who was a Seven Crown gang member that changed his life and became the mayor of the New York policeman, the um, borough president. Uh, first, he was a councilman, you know, started off a councilman, then in the Senate, then from a senator to, to um, a mayor, a borough president, and then to a mayor. So that just shows you how you can be a at-risk youth involved in streets, gangs and all that, but you could change, turn your life around and become a positive influence into your community. And that's what that documentary shows. It shows like Nas had a line. He said, <clears throat> he said, he said, he said some of this, he said, um, he said, he said, it's a chance to live sweet, think positive, because knowledge make the cipher complete. You could be an architect, design departments and shit, or you could wind up on a jail bus, dirty and clipped. If you listen to that line on TikTok, when he said you could be an architect, design apartments and shit, or you could wind up on a jail bus, dirty and clipped. He's telling you one way. The chance to live, the chance to live sweet. The other way is coke money and homicides. Me, he telling you, like these is these is this is the way you can choose in life. You could choose to live sweet, no convictions, no death, or you could think you can let you can go on it the other way with coke and homicides and jail meets, and that's what the documentary shows you. That you come from the same community and do positive things and do something to better yourself. You know what I'm saying? So that's one thing I liked about the Supreme Team documentary. It was a great documentary. And for the people that didn't like it, that just shows your mentality and your ignorance. Because if you don't like a documentary because they don't glamorize murders, they don't glamorize the uh, people getting killed they don't glamorize all of that like it's crazy to me you know what i'm saying yeah they talked about the 50 cent situation because it's an important situation yeah they talked a little bit about you know the troy singleton situation in the e-money bag situation right i think more people wanted to hear about you know his situation with green eye born and green eye born getting shot by baby wise but that's not for no documentary these brothers is trying to come home for an appeal you heard about the 50 Cent situation, what happened, who shot 50, you know. Everybody know who shot 50, you know what I'm saying? The dude that shot 50 is no longer here, you know. Homo was the driver. He was there on the scene. He didn't shoot 50. The dude that shot 50 is dead. Homo, who was the driver, is dead. God B is dead. You know, these people are deceased, you know. 50 know who shot him. The streets know who shot him. So. It's not like people didn't notice. These things have been known. You know, Hama was there. He was in the car. He was the driver. You know, God B, you know, was there. He was a shooter. The other dude that they said, the Ron Lawrence dude, I think he's not even living. I think he's deceased too. He also was the shooter. He's deceased. These people is deceased. You know, these are not people that are still living. So, you know, it is what it is. You know, people got to look at it like this, man. Like, it it wasn't about glamorification. It was not about glorifying. You know, everybody know what happened with E-Money Bags about the car situation. And E-Money Bags wanted his money back. You know, and then the, the shooting that happened at, you know, Jamaica Avenue. And Black just getting shot in the leg. And Preem not taking him to the hospital. You know, and Preem you know, pan again, and then he dropped him off at the hospital, and he died, you know, everybody know that, of a heart attack, 
you know, um, you know, in E Money Bags and Troy going, you know, at Murder Inc. and you know the whole, you know, thing that happened to the homie Gutter, him getting pistol whipped and you know, he was hiring for ecstasy and they took in his chain. Like these are stories that people been new, but like I said, it's not for nobody to tell, you know. You know, if you want to know about them stories, you can go read the book Queen's Reign Supreme. Great book, Ethan Brown. You know, um, great stories in there. Um, the book confirms a lot of things that now you hear in the news. Look, Stretch just heard Stretch basically his his case got solved. You know, Ronald Tenard, who we been knew that Tenard who killed Jam Master J was the one that killed Stretch. That was being known. But now you see the feds is like, oh yeah, we, we got you for the stretch murder. And then the Jam Master J. But these things been said back in 2005, 2004, three, you know. Derek Parker said these things. So if you want to read about these things, go read Ethan Brown's book, you know, Queen's Reign Supreme, or read the Notorious Cop. These stories is in there. You know, but me personally, it was a great documentary. I didn't see anything wrong with it. I thought the stories in there was great. I thought that, you know, to hear from Prime, to hear from Prince, you know, to basically get that documentary that people been wanting to see for years, you know what I'm saying? Like, they've been working on it, but it finally got motion. Nas did his thing. You know, Prime got another documentary coming out in December. I think it's going to be on Hulu, uh, Amazon, or... 2B, I know they shopping it through the networks. I know they shopping it to BET, 2B, Hulu, Amazon, and Netflix. I know they sh sh they shooting it. But the documentary is going to be about Prem's case, the why the illegal wiretaps. Um, going to talk about Prem's life and everything. It's going, you know, touch on Prem. The Supreme team was touching on him and Prince, and they appear because Prem. And Prince is working on the appeal. Like I said, Prince been in there since 2002. Prince been in there since 90, March of 90. Prince been in there December 2002. So these two been in there a long time. So they, they fighting the appeals. You know what I'm saying? So when dudes talk about, oh, yeah, right. You know, and the thing with Bimmy, you know, Prince don't fuck with Bimmy. You know, Prince, let it be known, he don't fuck with Bimmy like that. You know, the dudes that you see in the documentary, that's who he, he fucks with. Mook Diamonds, you know, you know, which is his godson, you know, um, Bing, you know, which was his, his right hand man from the beginning, you know, um, Green Eye Born, who was his other right hand man from the beginning, who was his lieutenant, you know, it was Green, it was Prince, Supreme, it was Green Eye Born, he's the original Supreme team, you know, so yes, that's who's going to be in there. You know, you got the homie Shannon and quite a few others that is preteen members that are in the documentary, you know? So when people say, yo, why, Bimmy? Like, listen, the preteen had a whole lot of members. Robo Just, R.I.P., Black Just, C. Just, God B., Baby Wise. It was a lot of members. It was a lot of members. Green team was a, a strong organization in Queens. But, you know, they, they talked about what they had to talk about. Yes, they talked about South Road. Yes, they talked about Fat Cat. Yes, they talked about, you know, a little bit of Corley, you know, and they talked about Pop, you know, because they did work for Pop Freeman and Ronnie Bump. Ronnie Bump was the, the man before, you know, Cream and them, you know, for titles. Ronnie Bump was the one that had the connection with the Italians through Pop Freeman. Pop Freeman was that dude. He was the he was the older dude that was running things in Queens. Ronnie Bump was like the younger, he was the youngest nigga doing it. He was young. You know, he was like a little bit older than Preem. I think he was close in age with Cat. And Preem and um Ronnie Bump, they was under, you know, they was under Ronnie Bump. You know, Cat. You know, he put Cat on, he put Prem on. I think he even put the Fatados on. He put all them dudes on because they all started with Ronnie Bump. Ronnie Bump, you know, after Ronnie Bump got incarcerated, I think in 82, 83, 81, 
Then Fat Cat took over for Tardos, Cream, Tommy Mickens, and his organization, Corley Wall. You know, these dudes, they took over Queens. You know what I'm saying? And they had, they was organized. They was an organized organization, which a bunch of them organized. The, the, the basically, they don't have no, no friction. They organized blocks. You know what I'm saying? So they had their own blocks and where they pumped that and they pumped here and they pumped there, but they organized it. You know, so that was what Cat and Prem and all of them. So, but Prem, his organization was more organized and more structured. Even when Prem was incarcerated, just and and Bimmy, they was holding it down. They was still doing their thing while Prem was locked up. You know, so the Prem and, and Prince, and Prince was locked up. You know what I'm saying? So they was still running the organization. You know, and you know Prem, you know. He's a, you know, he had a lot of, you know, like, like, like his lawyer said, you know, he had a lot of ties to rappers, you know, with the, the Russell Simmons in the world, you know, the, the, the Jay Z's, the Run DMC's, the LL Cool J's, you know, the Tupac Shakur's, the Puffy's, you know, the Irv Gotti's, the Ja Rule's, the Fitties, everybody, you know, was tied. And, and Preem was trying to get in the industry, you know what I'm saying? He was a small businessman. He had a barbershop, you know. He he was doing a lot of things, man. But it's just, you know, that ego and him being preem, he just didn't know how to, you know. It's like when John Gotti told Junior Gotti, man, this is all I know, you know. It's, it's death in prison. And you got to respect it. This is, you know, this is the life that they've chosen, you know. And preem understand that, you know. Um. It's sad, though, you know, because, you know, the man, you know, been in there a long time and he got a life sentence, you know. If he do win his appeal and he does come home, you know, it's it's sad, man, you know. That brother is, is brilliant minds, man. Preem was a brilliant mind, you know. The prince was a brilliant mind. He's just smart dudes, not dumb dudes, man. You know what I'm saying? These dudes that will tell you, like, when they talked about the whole Edward Burns things like, you know, we in the we we was organized. They, that's disorganized crime. That's stupid. The murder of policemen. You know what I'm saying? We don't do that. You know, and 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 you gotta respect Prem as you know him being the businessman that he is. He's about business. He's not about he's he's about business and he's about keeping the money flowing. He's not about unnecessary shit. You know, but. You know, what happened in the end, you know, it was all about ego in that situation. Um, the 50, the 50 part, he spoke about 50, you know, Preem said what he said, you know, and that's understandable, you know. I understand, you know, how Preem feel about 50, you know, and 50 went at them and, and, and you know, that was a situation where, you know, 50 was black justice man and, you know, Black just passed away, and then the whole beef went crazy. Um, like Prince said, man, you know, he didn't understand that, you know, the whole 50 Cent, and just a whole lot of the shit that was going on. But he wanted to see Prem, you know, do his thing. He was happy that Prem was doing his thing, though, with the movies and all that. So it was, to me, I feel like it was, it just shows you, like, the downfalls of, Egos and a whole lot of things, you know. Um, Sterling Jackson was in there, you know. Sterling Johnson, who basically was the one that went after Nicky Barnes and the Italian mob and the, the Colombian cartels and all that. He was in there, you know. And it's like when you look at that documentary, it's like, damn, son. You know, it's it's like the Supreme Team was like, I always say they they were like the council for the 80s and 90s because they was organized just like how Nicky Barnes and it was organized. You know? It's like, when you have organizations that's organized, those are the ones they come in. They get, they destroy. Disorganized crime is easy to just get them because it's disorganized. Everybody murdering, everybody doing this. But when it's organized, man, it's it's egos that's going to get everybody caught up, you know, and they had a run, 
you look, Preem and them had a long, the Supreme team had a long run. Even with them incarcerated, they still had a run. Where Cat and them was, they was crumbling. Like, they, they crumbled Cat organization, you know. Tommy Mickens organization, and, you know, others organization was getting, you know, Preem and them, they was still, like, going throughout the jug when Justin and them had it and Bimmy and them, you know. But when people say, why well, Bimmy not in the documentary, it's like, come on, my nigga. Bimmy already explained to you, him and Preem ain't on speaking terms. They haven't been on speaking terms since he's been incarcerated. So why would somebody that's not a good speaking term, you know, be in a documentary? That doesn't make any sense. You know what I'm saying? Like Bimmy and Bimmy fucks with 50. That's understandable. He, that's, that he said it. I fucks with 50. Preem don't fuck with me because I fucks with 50. He said that on Vlad. He said that on many other platforms. Queens flip, he said that. You know, that's his, that's the man that taught him everything. But him and Prem just don't speak on speaking terms. So you're not going to see him on the Supreme Team documentary. Even though he is a part of the team, he was a part of that. That was the move that he came from, but he's not in the documentary. And it is what it is. You know, he's not in there. People got to understand. If you don't understand why he's not in there, then hey. Documentary wasn't about Fat Cat. It was about Supreme Team. Yeah, Cat, they talk about Cat in there. They talked about, you know, Corley. They talk about the titles a little bit, and they talked about Ronnie Bump and Pop, but it was about Preem, his nephew. And it's about they talk about their messaging to the youth and their appeals. And it was great. I liked it. Thought it was a great documentary. I'm gonna watch it again. I enjoyed it. Um, it just shows you that um that we need to hear more OGs come out and do that. Enough of these fake OGs talking around. We need real OGs that are that's about messaging. That's not about bragging about murdering and killing and, and plaguing the community. You listen to Preem, you listen to Prince. These is brothers that is about trying to breed a solution, not the problem. And when I hear people want to hear them brag about the, 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 the demise, it's crazy. Like when AZ, when AZ talks about the positive day, right? They don't want to hear that. They just want to hear AZ talk about, well, how many calls y'all had? How much bricks you moved? How much bodies been dropped? You know what I'm saying? Like, what are we talking about? That's what was his problem with Dane Dash with, with Peyton Full. Like, all they wanted to do was glamorize street culture and not glamorize the messaging, not glamorize the messaging that, yo, stay out, don't do this. Because the original, I seen the original Peyton Full, the bootleg version. The bootleg version is better than the actual version. It had more of a message than the version that they dropped um, in the movies, in the theories. The bootleg version is the better version because it's the actual script, trapped. You know, and it had more of a message. And I think that's what Paid in Full was supposed to be, more of a message than just some glamour, just glamorizing street culture and the drug dealing. Like, if that's what you wanted to see, the Supreme Team documentary, then I'm sorry. That that documentary wasn't about that. It was about two brothers that have been incarcerated for so many years that's trying to be the solution for their community and trying to give a positive message to the youth that we got to do better. And we, we fell victims of the, the traps of the game that we would use as pawns. If you don't get that, then I don't know what to tell you. So salute the Supreme, salute the Prince, salute to the to Nas, salute to that whole documentary, great documentary. For the haters that didn't like the documentary, hey, <laughs> it wasn't for you. Because <laughs> if you wanted them to glamorize the murders and all that, <laughs> then I don't know what to tell you. That's crazy.